Hi, it's Dennis Daly. When I used to do my radio show on the road, I always wanted to go to California wine country. The hospitality was so great there, and they kept throwing food and drink at me. Back in 1999, I was invited to meet with the CEO of Corbell, the champagne people. They had put together the world's largest champagne bottle. They were taking it around the U.S. in preparation for celebrating the new year, the year 2000. I mentioned to the CEO, Gary Heck, that I was amazed when I went to wine country the first time as to just how many grapes were being grown. There's a lot of grapes grown in, in Northern California. Um, they're not compared to the landscape size like you would like to see in Europe where everything is covered with vineyards. Although we do have thousands and thousands of acres up here in the Northern California. And uh, you've got the Central Coast growing, growing grapes. You've got the Delta area growing grapes. So, I mean, what you're seeing it right here now at Corbell is, is the end of the production system. And there's a million... 400,000 cases that come out of this facility. So if you think all the facilities in California, you know, there's something like 70 million cases. How many uh, bottles of champagne per case? 12. Normally 12 bottles per case. I know I had the happy occasion some time ago of uh, being with your people in New Orleans, seeing the world's biggest champagne bottle. I've forgotten the statistics on it, but it's taller than both of us. Yeah, it, it's a little taller than five feet. It's uh, 360 pounds. It's 117 liters. It took it took 160 regular Corbel champagne bottles to fill it. My goodness! Can we walk over here? Uh, there's a lady over here who is. Uh, we may have to yell a little bit. Who's watching the bottles? I think it would be kind of a tedious job. What imperfections are? are is, is she looking for at this point? Well, what she's looking for right now, this is one of our final inspectors before the bottles go into the case. What she's looking for right now is to make sure that every label is in line. So this is not the spot where she looks for the clarity of the champagne or anything. This is strictly labeling and making sure that all the labels, the crests and everything are lined up together. This is purely cosmetic. has nothing to do with content. Nothing to do with content at this point. I'll show you down here where we have that portion. Okay. I hope everyone at home can hear us. This is uh, not so noisy that you can't work here, but boy, there's a lot. Do you ever hear one go pop or crack? Not, not in this room. Because that, if this room, this is where they've been disgorged, and it actually this will be after the disgorging, which is where they take the yeast and the sediment out of the bottle, which is that machine way over to the left. At this point, the pressure is lower here than it is during fermentation. So if they were going to blow, they would blow in the other room. Tell you what, let's walk back out here. You know, oh, oh okay. What, uh, you're leading me around. You want to describe it from here? Yeah, now, as you can see, this machine that has the light panel behind it, and all the bottles are, are actually upside down going through there. This inspector, what she's looking for is any chips or any stones in the glass and make sure that all the sediment came out so it's perfectly clear champagne at that point. I think, Gary, if we can uh, go over here, this might be a good time to try to explain exactly what champagne is. You talk about the, uh, the disgorging process. I know from visiting, I won't mention the name, one of your competitors many years ago, they taught me the word riddling. Uh, right. Can you explain for the layman what makes champagne champagne? Certainly. Uh, first, there are two different ways of making champagne in this country. There's the bulk process, which is you make the wine into a stainless steel tank, and then you let it ferment in there under pressure, and then it puts bubbles in. It takes about 30 to 60 days. And then you, you bottle it, you put it, you put that now sparkling wine into a bottle, and that is, the, that is the bulk transfer method, okay? The traditional method, which is what we do here at Corbell, we start with making wine just like you would regular table wine. And then we bottle it with some yeast and sugar, and it goes through a secondary fermentation in the bottle. And it takes about 18 months for that that yeast and sugar that turns the sugar into carbon dioxide gas and that's what puts the bubbles in the champagne but then when that process is done after 18 months then you've got all this ugly stuff floating around in the sh in the champagne and that's where you have to riddle it mostly used up yeast used yeast yeast cells and some uh diastomation earth which is a filtering agent in there to help bring the yeast down to the neck of the bottle what we do is then we turn the bottles upside down and we riddle them 
So the cork down. And when riddling means shaking the bottles or vibrating the bottles, it used to be done by hand, but everybody does them automatically now. Some use a French gyro palette. We use our own invented palettes, it own invented riddling machines here. They shake the bottles and they bounce the bottles so that all the yeast and sediment come down to about an inch in the, in the neck of the bottle. And then you take the bottle still with the neck down and you put it in a, in a freezing solution, which, which is a, a, a glycol, but it's the kind of glycol you can drink, not the kind that's in your car. And what it does is it freezes about two inches of the neck of the bottle, which actually freezes that champagne and that yeast. Then you can turn the bottle upright and it goes down the conveyor belt and it has a bottle cap on it at that point. At that point, then the bottle cap is lifted off, the pressure in the bottle will shoot the champagne and the ice plug out, and you've got the clear champagne behind. And then you add your sugar, if you want it to be brood or extra dry, or like no sugar added for like natural, and that's, that is the actual process of making the champagne. Who the heck ever thought of that? I mean, it, I know champagne goes back a couple of centuries before mechanization, the whole concept of being able to freeze the neck to form a kind of artificial cork inside while you clean this other material out, that's a stroke of genius. Well, it, it originally, champagne was originally invented by a Benedictine muck in, in the 17th century. And what he was doing is he was using some waxed rags in his wine bottles to seal the wine bottles that maybe they, so hopefully they would, they would last longer. And so what happened is because he sealed the bottle and they weren't completely fermented, they re-fermented re in the bottle and when he opened it, of course in those days they didn't take the sediment out, they just left it in the bottom of the bottle, but the top of the champagne, the first half of the champagne bottle or the wine bottle in those days, which had bubbles in it, and his comment was, I think I'm drinking stars. So that he was a Benedictine monk back in the 17th century is the one that discovered the way of making champagne. Can we get a little bit out of the noise here? Sure. You say the 17th century. Uh, so many of the wines uh, and the progress in wine, uh, so many of those things were the result of sacramental wine, monks in monasteries. Uh, just as an aside, how much of wine country here in California was the result of the Padres? Was the result of, of the Padres, the the, the oh, missions here, the missions and everything. That's how it all got started here. You know, they came up here, and, and uh, even the, when the Corbell, before the Corbells were even here, all the wines that were made in this country were actually made for for sacramental wines, and all. And then and that got it started, like the the Christian Brothers family and some of the older families. And then it got to be, uh, then of course Prohibition came in, and that kind of killed everything for a while. And then when it started back up, it really started more up as as a business. I, I interrupted myself. The question I was going to ask about champagne, you say going back to the 17th century, do we know how far back it was first used for celebrations? I mean, that that is the image it seems to have now. Well, it, wine in general goes back to some of the writings on the pyramid walls. So, I mean, it goes back to way, way B.C. I mean, there, it, I don't think there's anything in the history books or any of the... Uh, historical documents that didn't have wine with it at one point or another. But I'm thinking, for example, the celebration you had in, in New Orleans, the ones you're having across country now, you're preparing for New Year's Eve. In my mind, so much of the image of champagne is tied to parties. It's tied to a celebratory kind of atmosphere, unlike regular wine. Uh, but in essence, you're saying champagne is technically sparkling wine? It technically is. Yes, it is sparkling wine. It is wine that has been uh, naturally changed into a spark putting the bubbles in it. So it is, it is a wine, and it is a sparkling wine. And uh, the, the Europeans believe that the Champagne region of France is Champagne. Here in the United States, we can call it Champagne as long as we put the place of origin in front of it, such as California Champagne. Uh -huh. Well, now, when all of this is done, it takes an awful lot of work. It's labor-intensive, even though you have machines doing it now. I know what the answer to this is going to be, but why not do it the easy way? Why not just throw it in a big tank and bottle it? Why, why go through all this work? The taste characteristics between bulk process or the transfer method versus the traditional original fermented in this bottle champagne style that we do at Corbell, the taste profiles are completely different. This is much more delicate, much more fruity. It's not less sweet. It's not the big bubbles. It's little tiny bubbles. It's, and it's the bubbles that make the champagne is, is what you're really tasting for. But champagne's always been, as you were talking earlier, a drink of celebration. What we're trying to do in, in, in the industry in the United States and the rest of the world is we're trying to 
trying to get the, the, the consuming public to understand that champagne goes well with anything. Any types of food, it goes good with Oreo cookies, it goes good with potato chips, hot dogs. It is an everyday beverage, and that's what the champagne uh, industry is trying to do, is trying to spread this out more than just a special occasion drink. After going through the bottling area, we went to one of the tasting rooms, and I asked Gary how important it is to Corbell and to the wine industry in general to let the public come in, have a taste, have something to eat, and share in the ambiance. We have seven different types of champagnes that we produce, plus we make four different kinds of wines. And this way the consumer can come in here when, after they've taken a tour and they learn, they've learned how we make the champagne, they can taste it and they can find the one that they prefer. It's very important to all the wineries to have a tasting room. Now, would I, as a person who really doesn't drink that much wine, not that I don't like it, I just never did very much, I'm beginning to get a little bit of a palate. Are, are your champagnes different enough that I would be able to tell? I mean, are, are, are there subtle differences, or are there differences that a layman would really understand? Most of the champagnes, the, the, especially Corbels, the layman will be able to understand the difference because there, there is quite a difference between the Brut and the Extra Dry when it comes to the sweetness level. There's a major difference between the Brut and the Natural on the sweetness level. The Natural is bone dry, it's very tart, where the, the Brut is a little softer, and then when you get into the Extra Dry, it's almost a little sweet. You know, I guess sugar is the name of the game. I've been in wine country at harvest time, and you see all the bees around the grapes that are coming in, and you know why they're there. There's a lot of sugar, yes, a lot of sugar in the grapes. Absolutely, and, and uh, I remember being over in, uh, in uh, Napa one time, and uh, one of the winemakers over there had me taste several of them, and finally I had a, it was a Muscat Canelli, I think I was, I was drinking, and I said, this is my favorite. He said, you don't want wine, you want something to pour over ice cream. Muscat Canelli is a very, uh, uh, the Muscat grape itself is very, very fruity. It's almost like a Concord style, uh, almost like grape juice. It's not really a, a, a wine style grape. But the, you know, the, the, the amount of sugar that's in a, in a grape is, determines how much alcohol is going to be in there. So when you pick the grapes at 22 bricks sugar, you're going to get about 12% alcohol. So if you pick them at 40, you'll get 20. I need to talk about something that, that is really tough to do on radio, but I would be remiss if I didn't bring this up, and that is the gorgeous artwork in labels. I mean, you look at your Corbell labels, and, and uh, is it Kenwood? Kenwood, yes. That's which, a which is a, a wine uh, line, but the, the artwork is absolutely phenomenal. I mean, I have bought wine sometimes to see what it's like, <laughs> only because I like what the label looked like. There have been dramatic changes in the last 30 years because on, on the labeling. 30 years ago, the, the, the generation before me, like my father, he would never change a label. If it was selling and it was working well, they would not change anything. The, old, the older generation really just kept everything exactly the way it was because they said if it's not broke, don't fix it. But with, the, with 800 wineries now in California, and the amount of the, the new technology that, that's happening, the labels have made dramatic changes. There are absolutely gorgeous labels out there on the shelf now. Every year we look at our labels to make sure that we are state of the art. Even though we want to keep our old heritage and tradition, we want to make sure that we, they are modern enough and that they're eye-catching enough that when someone's walking down the shelf and there's 800 wineries there, that they'll maybe the eye-catch will be the Corbell. Well, now, in Rohnert Park, which is on 101 north of San Francisco, there, there is a wine and visitors center there. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, you can see product from several hundred of the vendors around here. It would be a wonderful place to go to look at labels. Absolutely. It's the Sonoma County Wineries Association, which is not, and, and, they, and the state named that as the Wine Visitor Center for Sonoma County. There's about 115 members so there's, uh, of Sonoma County, and it's about 120 members are 120 wineries in Sonoma County, so 90% of the wineries are represented there. and They have at least two labels of every winery there. It has amazed me over the years, maybe amaze is not the right word, it's impressed me over the years how even though you're all competitors here in wine country, you work together, whether it's on disease eradication, the phylloxera problem, somebody needs a piece of equipment, someone else has it, working together in the wine center, getting together for an auction or a charitable event. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think, you know, our industry is a little different than, than most other uh, widget industries, for an example. You know, we are farmers, basically, that we take, our, we take our farming product and we make it into a beverage alcohol, wine, 
brandy or, or what have you. And the one thing that we do very well is we do work together as, as a community in charitable events and, and, and disease fightings and uh, anti-tax, you know, with the government and kind of stuff. So with the California Wine Institute, we're, we're all, most of them are members. So we have a, we have a, a very large political force. But we decide that the, our industry, if we're going to compete, we'll compete out in the shelf. Let's not compete in-house. Let's, we're all neighbors. Let's all be friends. We get out to the stores. That's when the pricing can, the distributors, they, they can do all those wars. We don't need to do those. We think we're real old here, Corbell being 117 years old. I mean, I mean, a lot of the Europeans will come over here and go, yes, but I live in a 3,000-year-old uh, home. You know, it, 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 we are still a very young industry when it comes to the worldwide, but uh, it, there are a lot of comments. People are, people are just amazed at the size of these redwood trees that we have here. You know, some of them are, are 400 feet tall. And, well, the ones you can drive through. Oh, yeah. You know, you go up a little north up in Redding and stuff, you can actually drive through them, but, but uh, the, we have what we call the coastal redwoods here, which are absolutely gorgeous redwood trees. And most of the trees that you see here are either the redwood or the Douglas fir, and they're absolutely breathtaking. Gary, tell us a little bit about you. Uh, you alluded to the fact that you're the second, at least, generation of, of winemakers here. Yes, uh, uh, second at Corbell. Uh, my great grandfather goes back to Alsace Lorraine, so I'm actually fourth, fourth uh, generation winemaker and, and winery owner. But uh, Alsace Lorraine is, is that old joke. They keep moving the border every night. That's why I don't know if I'm French or German. It, it just depends on which war you're talking about. Uh, but I, you know, I literally grew up here. Uh, Dad bought this company in 1954. I was born in 47. Uh, when he bought it, he was president of Italian Swiss Colony at those days, which was the world's largest winery, in, or the United States' world's largest winery. Well, there's a name I haven't heard in a while. Yeah, it, well, it used to be bigger than Gallo. And then uh, Dad decided that he wanted to have his own winery, so in 1954 he bought Corbell. And I just kind of grew up here and, and uh, knew that this was going to be my, my destiny to, to work here at the winery. You know, we're the same age then, and my dad worked for Montgomery Ward, and my childhood was hanging around the plumbing department helping sort little pieces of pipe and things like that. What was it like as a kid to grow up in a winery? I mean, it must have been like Disneyland. Well, it was fabulous. It was absolutely fabulous here. Although, you know, right now when you look around here, you see nothing but vineyards. Back then, in the, in the early... Uh, late 50s, early 60s, we still had a lot of pasture land here. We had, uh, you know, we ran around on our horses, we ran around on our jeeps. It was like, it was like growing up in the in the in the wild, wild west. And and then of course as we as we grew and we did expand vineyards and we had to pull out the prune trees and plant more vineyards, uh, it, it got to be more of a winery. But uh, you know, I did everything growing up as a kid, from picking grapes, to making wine. You know, I started in the started out on the out on the ranch and then worked through the all the different processes and making champagne and then ended up in the offices and then in, eventually ended up being president and chairman. When did most, most of the expansion in wine country happen from the, the few old line uh, vineyards uh, that were here to two things happening, if I understand my history, and that is a lot of people here in California investing, but also a lot of what you might call gentleman farmers, not all of whom were accepted at first, guys from the east who had money and thought, hey, let's go out and buy up some land. W was that mostly in the 70s? W when, when did the big balloon happen here? The mid-70s and early 80s is when the, it, it, you, every time you turned around, there was another winery being built or somebody else coming in, uh, Silicon Valley, the big money people coming in and, and buying wineries and wanting to, wanting to be a winery. Uh, I, that has slowed down a lot. Now there's a lot of consolidation going on with uh, some wineries going public and buying other wineries and uh, having a conglomerate of wineries. There's, there's not a whole lot of us small family-owned wineries left. Most of it, it's a pretty big business now in a lot of in a lot of them. But, but it built the 70s and 80s is when the big boom came because you know, there was a lot of growth in the industry in those days. But what has happened here is you have these two adjacent counties, Sonoma and Napa, each of which you might say is kind of north-south as far as the main roads go, that a person could almost spend a month up here going from every little winery, every little tasting room, that they could make a summer out of this. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. There's about 130 wineries in, in Napa. There's about 120 here. And then you've got the, you've got the uh, Monterey, you've got uh, Mendocino County. I mean, you've got 800 wineries in California. So, I mean, you could spend the, you could, you, Tamekla, down, down almost by San Diego, you've got wineries. You've got wineries all over California.
And I didn't realize till the other day that there is a winery in downtown Los Angeles. I forget the name of it, but it's right off the warehouse district. And I thought it's as if it were dropped out of the sky. I'm hot to call you and tell you what St. Francis or something, but it's it's this little winery and it's in downtown L.A. I've never knew that there was a winery <laughs> I did, in L.A. I, I took a wrong turn one day. Gosh, I hope I didn't dream that. Let's let's talk a, l a little bit about your distribution. Do do you have to do this state by state? Someone told me that the, the distribution of wine, the sales of it nationally, is, is pretty tricky and, and paperwork intensive for the winery. It's, you almost have to look at the United States when you're dealing from California or New York, doesn't matter, wherever your winery is, that, that each state has its own regulations. So it's like dealing with 50 different countries. Now, most states are, are what they call three-tier protected. That means that it has to come from supplier to distributor to retailer, then to the consumer, ultimately. There's only like two states in the whole United States that aren't three-tier protected where a winery could actually sell directly to a retailer. And that would be California and Washington, D.C. That's the only two areas. Everything else is what they call three-tier protected, so you actually have to have a distributor. Let's talk about getting to know wines, getting to know champagnes. Uh, uh, and I've asked this question many times, but there are still an awful lot of people who either, like myself, grew up in a rural part of the U.S. where we didn't do wine except on Easter, and my grandmother would buy a bottle of Manischewitz, which is a fine wine, but compared to what's being done here in California, Manischewitz just kind of qualifies as far as I'm concerned. Or look back and, and still have it either a religious objection or fears for a lot of other reasons, who don't realize how much a part of our culture, our evening meal and everything, wine is, where can they go to get information? If they're out in some rural part of the country, for example, how's the best way to make yourself knowledgeable aside from taking a trip out here? Well, you, you know, the wonderful things now that you have is you do have the Internet. And all the wineries, a lot of the wineries are on the Internet. So you can get, learn a lot of information there, and you can get descriptions on the taste profiles of, of a certain wine. If, if, you, you know, if you like a sweet wine, then you're going to probably want to start off with German wines and work your way into, into the drier California-style wines of the Chardonnays and the Pinot Blancs and the Sauvignon Blancs. Uh, it, you know, the, most people that aren't wine drinkers will start with white. They won't start with red. And they will gradually, eventually get into red. Because reds are a, a lot... Uh, more difficult to understand and a lot more complex mm. and so it takes a long time to appreciate the reds well, a lot of people uh, will will start with the blush wine for an example the the the, the um, pinky ones the pink the pink ones yeah. because they are traditionally always been a little sweeter than the, than the dry wines if, you know if you take somebody that's really not a wine connoisseur or, or doesn't drink a lot of wine and you hand them a glass of Chardonnay they're probably not going to like it at first. We are privileged to be walking around with the CEO of Corbell, Gary Heck. We've been to the tasting room, the bottling room. Right now we're talking about wines in general and not just champagne and I ask him whether or not there wasn't a debate about the temperature at which wine should be served and after all the first wines were developed well before the era of refrigeration. Most wines traditionally were, were served at room temperature. Um, the, the rule of thumb is you, you serve the red wines at room temperature, you serve the white wines chilled. Um, the white wines, if they're served at room temperature, you will get more flavors out of them. It's just that people, I think, traditionally really think that white wines need to be chilled way down. Uh, we chill the white wines when, like, when we serve them here, but they're not as cold as they would come out of a refrigerator. But traditionally, of course, champagne is served chilled. Ab yes, absolutely. Champagne must be served chilled. Uh, two reasons. One, when you open it, if it's not chilled, the half the bottle will probably empty when you take the cork out because of the, the pressure within. So it, it, champagne needs to be served chilled. I don't mean to put in a negative thing here, but is, is this not too early as we head toward this huge celebration we're going to have on New Year's Eve? Uh, at the end of this year, and you will be in Times Square with that. To warn people about popping corks, I mean, I in the news media, we read a lot of things that there's so much news of people getting hurt doing that. Can you explain the proper way to pop a cork on champagne so you don't lose the contents and you don't hit anybody in the nose with it? Certainly, and we actually have on our back label a description on how to open the champagne that, that it don't use a corkscrew, don't use, uh, don't point it towards somebody. And the, the proper way of opening a bottle of champagne is once it's chilled, 
You remove the foil around the neck, and you remove the wire cap. Put a towel over it, hold the bottle at about a 45 degree angle, hold the cork very firmly in, in your hand, turn the bottle, not the cork, and let the, bot let the cork just kind of come out real slow. It should never pop. It should just kind so of... that's fit. just theatrics. It's just theatrics, the popping. Oh, my goodness. Well, now, something behind you. I want to move over here and, and ask about this. We talked about the world's largest champagne bottle, which you now have going around the U.S. Here's, here's a three-liter bottle. This is about, what, a foot and a half, almost two feet tall, I guess. And, and here again, the label and the artwork on this is absolutely gorgeous. Do you sell... This is $65. What would this be for, a wedding? I mean, I'm trying a, to figure out, this This is a cut above anything else I've well, seen. Well, we, we have the three liter, we have some uh, six liter, we also have some 12 liter, which is, which is almost uh, three times that size. Normally these are used for a, a banquet or a function where, you know, if you're going to have uh, ten people at a, at a dinner, you could open this bottle and serve, the, serve everybody out of this single. It's, it's more of a, a, uh, a, a prestigious way to impress your guests. Oh. And for $65, you can do it here. Yes, yes. By the way, I, I'm thinking of a word in the back of my mind that I heard one vintner tell me, is it a Methuselah? That some of the really big bottles of wine have, have biblical names? Or they, they, all have, they all or have something? Bi biblical names except the 12 liter. Really? And the 12, the 12 liter is, um, I don't remember, what, Margie, what's the 12 liter? About yeah, but About where, where did that come from? That... Is Balthazar's it? Feast, there's um, it, it comes from... Well, you know, we might as well introduce this lady. Would you tell our listeners who this lady is? She's the one who made all the arrangements for me to right. come up here. Margie Healy, she's our Director of Public Relations, and she handles all the interviews and makes sure that I, I, I don't say something too stupid. <laughs> I know that she's been tagging along. What is it like, Margie, to, to work, not necessarily here because your boss is standing here, I don't want to ask that, but you're in an industry which by itself is supposed to be fun. You're not the PR director of some shoe company. I mean, I, th I think this would just be a wonderful thing to do. It's, it's very exciting. Um, I have been in this industry for over 23 years, and to me, there just isn't any other industry. I mean, I love it. Um, and in 23 years, every day is a new day, always something different, watching the industry grow and different issues and things like that. It's really been exciting. Are you a native here also? Native San Franciscan. Mm. So just a short migration. Yes. Well, I want to tell the listeners at home that you put me up in a guest house, which is on the property here last night. That's absolutely, it's called the Vintner's House. And it, or, or is that, did I get yeah. that right? And, yeah. Or not the Vineyard House. It's the, it could be either one. The, Vintner's House it's the, the Vineyard It says VH right. on, on the outside of it. And I don't think I have spent a night alone with time to think in quiet the way it is. I didn't even hear... You know, no noises, except every time the heat would come on, I would think somebody was knocking on the door. But uh, it, it's just so pristine up here. I mean, I really enjoyed it. Thank you. It's very, very quiet. Very quiet here at nighttime. <laughs> it's almost eerie it's so quiet. Yeah. I, I, as I say, I'm glad that I don't have trouble stand, uh, staying by myself. Look over there. Can we go over here? You've got a bunch of ribbons. Oh, well, no, there's several cases of them here. Are these... Uh, from county fairs or comp national competitions? Most of them are, are gold. We only put the gold medals in, and most of the gold medals you see here are, are from all kinds of Orange County Fair, the uh, Dallas News Fair. I mean, we have all kinds of awards that we, we get every year. And right over here, you'll see the, the, the world's largest champagne glass. And that was uh, built in 1921 for the San Francisco World Fair. We wanted to originally send this along with the world's largest champagne bottle. But it's it's too delicate and it's too old. It wouldn't it wouldn't take the trip. It's a magnificent piece of work. I can best describe it. It's not one piece of glass. It's it's as you see stained glass windows where there are sections that have lead between them. But it's it's marvelous. Yeah, it's a very very beautiful piece. Yeah, but it would be a dirty shame, as you say, to go out and 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 break it. Uh, where do you want to go next? Let's go up to the pool house. Okay, wh the the which house? The pool house. That's pool. Where we uh, entertain VIP guests. And oh, it's fine with me. <laughs> Welcome to Corbell. Thank you. This is Gail, and we're now in the pool house, and you have poured for us Corbell Natural. And I want to say one thing. You talked about the Internet. Not that anybody wouldn't know how to spell Corbell, but it only has one L. 
That's at correct. the end, and it starts with a K. It's K O R B E L. So don't go looking for it on the World Wide Web as C O R B E L L. No, K O R B E L dot com. We are in Guerneville, California, a beautiful part of the Russian River. My host is Gary Heck, a personable, gregarious fellow who is an expert on wine. He is the head of Corbell, K O R B E L. In the closing minutes, I wanted to talk to Gary about the way America's attitude about wine has been changing. Years ago, the best wines in American stores were imported. Now they're California wines. Gary says that's largely because of the new expertise and academics involved in growing grapes here. The amount of education that goes to UC Davis and uh, Sonoma State University and Fresno for viticulture enology, our industry has grown so much and it has become so sophisticated that we actually make as good if not better wines than Europe. And with the whole American public growing up and understanding that wine in moderation is healthful and probably uh, helps the cardiovascular, it, it has become so prevalent that wine is such a staple in the American diet today that, that you do see an awful lot more out there than you ever have in the past. Well, we hear a lot about the French paradox, the, the, the interesting thing. Of course, that goes over into food also and eating rich foods. But the more we seem to learn about wine consumption in moderation in Europe, the more we see the positive health aspects. And it's only been recently that the FDA or some government agency has now said, go ahead, you can mention that on labels. That's correct. We, as a matter of fact, it was only uh, two weeks ago or last week that we got the, the right to put on, instead of just the warning labels that said don't drink and drive and and pregnant women shouldn't be uh, the, the, the standard warning label that's on our, on the labels. We now just got to prove that we can say wine in moderation, right to the dietary guidelines in in the federal registry, and they will send you. So wine in moderation has become such a health benefit to a lot of people. Now that's not to say that if you're a diabetic or you have other health reasons why you shouldn't consume alcohol. That's what what we're trying to say. We're just trying to say that to learn more about the the health aspects of wine right our government they'll send you the information one final thing as you travel around the country and overseas uh, connected with Corbell an internationally known name what does it feel like to go into a store somewhere or a, a PX at a military installation overseas and you say hey I recognize that bottle not exactly but it <coughs> not exactly but it came from from our winery to to have your personal, I'm going to start that over, to, to have your own life connected with such a recognizable product, it must feel good. It's, it's always amazing to me, you know, when I travel, and you know, I, I live here in Guerneville, and, and we have this little winery, and we, we do a lot of bottles, and, and then I travel throughout the, the country and, and the world, and I see my product out there on 50 case displays or on the shelf. It, it's almost amazing to me because I don't realize that the size of Corbell that it really is until you're out there and you see it. Because I still think of us as a little tiny winery up in Sonoma County. And it, we're a pretty significant player in the champagne industry. Well, Gary, thanks again for having me up here. I guess my next uh, encounter with Corbell will be uh, this summer. I'll try to find you guys as your cross-country tour continues. And you also need to come back and see a crush. Okay. Gary, thanks. Thank you. That was a fun trip to Corbell. Then I was invited to meet them in New Orleans and did a show down there. And finally, although I wasn't there, Corbell helped celebrate the coming of what they call the millennium in 2000. Everyone overlooked the fact that Arthur C. Clarke was right. The millennium began in 2001. I'm Dennis Daly.